so this week I'm lucky enough to be joined by Amy Stokes Waters, uh, the owner and CEO of the Cyber Escape Room Company. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us, Amy. Um, yes, that's, that's all right. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure. Good, good. So just before we get into um, into the topics today, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about um, about yourself and how you got into this space. Uh, yeah, cool. So I was, um, I've always been in sales and marketing, kind of in IT, um, moved into a sales role at a pen testing company and kind of really got involved with the community from there. Um, decided to start my own business, um, realized I'm not technical at all. Like someone asked me the other week if I could find the command line on my laptop and I was like, what does that even mean? Um, so like, so not technical, it's unreal. Um, so I was like, right, what can I do? And I realized that, uh, yeah, cybersecurity training is really, really bloody boring. So um, I thought, let's mix that up a bit. So, yeah, started started a company, um, was focused on cyber escape rooms. That's uh, perfect. I mean, I wish... I wish more non-technical people would get into would get into cybersecurity. Definitely, because um, it doesn't need to be so daunting, does it? Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, boy, you hit mm. you hit the nail on the head. With quite a good uh, a good place to start, I guess. Is is just to talk about why on earth cybersecurity awareness training is so boring. Um, and I think it's it's a perception that I think is probably held both in in within IT teams themselves and the whole the wider organisation that have to take part in it. Um, and it always, you know, it always seems like more of a drag than anything. So mm. I guess my first question to you is, um, you know, could you share some examples of the kind of things that companies are doing wrong traditionally when it comes to to those training methods? Yeah, I think from what I've experienced, I mean, obviously I've worked in quite a few companies and we've had to do mandatory cybersecurity training. Um, it's Well, A, it's really dull. So... No one really is that engaged in it. I mean, I, when I relaunched the business back in October, I had 50-ish CISOs in a room. And um, I did a little talk at the beginning and I said to everyone, right, can you all put your hands up if you've done security awareness training? Thankfully, everyone put their hand up because, you know, they're on charge of that shit. Um, so that was a relief. Um, but I said to them, keep your hands up if you have clicked play on a video, walked off to make a cup of tea, and then come back again and hope that the video would finish. And I said to them, if you put in your hands down, you're categorically a liar. Because I know for a fact that you've not sat through it. <laughs> and if you're not sitting through it and it's your specialist subject, how the hell are you expecting anyone else in the company to engage in it? Why the, Why would sales care if you're not, if you don't care? And that should be your mastermind subject, right? So I think there's that issue that it is dull. Um, then there's the issue around, I always find it's punitive. So... Mm. If you fail a phishing assessment or a phishing campaign or whatever, um, yeah. if you fail that, then you end up being mandated to do some more training. Where's the? It's mm. too much. I think it's too much stick and not enough carrot, in my opinion. Which is why I kind of wanted to flip it on its head and make it something that people want to do rather than have to do. Well, it makes perfect sense. I mean, <laughs> it, it benefits. It benefits the whole company if it if we can get people engaged in this in this mm -hmm. cybersecurity in this awareness training and what so what do you think um what do you think that lack of engagement at the moment that we're seeing how do you think that affects like the cybersecurity posture of your average company well i think if you're not engaging in the training then you're not understanding the threats that are actually you're faced with every day i mean everyone receives phishing emails um everyone has passwords that they're using and if you don't understand if you if you've not sat through that training and understood these is this is kind of the consequences of you sharing your password with someone or the consequences of you clicking on a phishing email, if you don't understand that, then you're leaving your company wide open to threats. So yeah, if people don't understand like how they could be targeted, then they're not on the lookout for it. So people are staying vigilant, and then it ends up we end up back in that cycle where we're like users are the weakest link again, which drives me insane. But I think we're talking about that later, so I won't go into it now. Um, but yeah, I think it's um, I think. We're not um, we're not providing ongoing training, so we're doing it as a tick box kind of exercise because you know people have got insurance um, policies that they need to comply with. So if we're doing it as a tick box exercise, then people are forgetting the information as well. So I think we need to kind of look at ongoing security training, and we need to make it more engaging. That makes perfect sense. I mean, do you think do you think there are um, some misconceptions around cybersecurity training that are 
that are really contributing to that. They're probably not misconceptions. They're probably they're probably truths actually. Because <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think like in the so IT... it is it is just it is just dull. We are just getting it wrong. It is yeah. But I think yeah. in the IT world, in in the IT world especially, we think cybersecurity is quite interesting. And I mean, how many people do you know in the industry who are like, I'm a cybersecurity rock star because I one time hacked the White House. <laughs> like, there's fucking oh. loads of them in there. I mean, loads of them. Yeah, um, cybersecurity rock stars. Yeah, but um, but at kind of the less techie end of the spectrum, identifying phishing emails is actually really boring. It is boring. Watching an animated yeah. video about about it isn't making it more exciting. I'm not twelve. I don't want to watch a cartoon. Um, so I think that's that's nonsense. But then I think um, yeah, we've got an image issue in the whole cybersecurity space anyway, which I don't think really, yeah. uh, which I don't think really helps with um engaging people that are not in the industry. So if you look at well, we've got the hackers in hoodies thing, which yeah. if you're, you know, a 23-year-old girl that likes going out and doing bottomless brunch, probably not really relating with that, are you? Um, nice. Oh, we've got the we've got the IT crowd vibe going on as well. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> not really. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's not really necessarily misconceptions. I think there's an image issue, um, yeah. and then I think there is just the harsh reality that it is boring. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I do agree. Um... So with with that being said, what what can we do differently then? What so like can we take different approaches or or use different technology to make that more engaging? And I'm guessing the answer is yes. Yes, the answer is definitely yes because I'm doing it every day. Um, so I think continuous learning is really crucial, especially in cyber. So if your job's not cybersecurity, which ninety five percent of the organisation it isn't, but we still expect them to bloody understand it. If you're if that's not your organ if that's not your area, then you probably it's not probably not at the forefront of your mind all the time. I know we want it to be at the forefront of people's minds, but it's not because, like we said earlier, they're doing tick box compliance things, they're doing training once a year, whatever. Um, so your brain's not keeping that information in. You are it, it's just a fact, right? Um, so we need to do continuous learning. So if you've got bite-sized bits of information, so there's um, like cyber off, you know, Ian Murphy who does his videos. If you've got that's, something like that. Yeah. Where it's like three minutes, watch a video, done. Or we've got um, stuff like Hoxon or Culture AI where it's continuous learning in the workflow. So if you f up, it'll send you a message and say, here's what you've done wrong. We've fixed it for you. Don't do it again. So it kind of keeps it at the forefront of your mind. But yeah, we know bite-sized learning works. I mean, I'm going to show my age here and remind everyone that BBC Bite Size used to be a thing when you did your GCSEs. I'm not sure if it's still around now, but I remember that coming out. I don't know. Um, yeah, but that was that was bite that was bite sized bits of learning to help you with the GCSEs. So it's a proven it's a proven method in terms of yeah. um, uh, like a pedagogical method for you know conveying information. Do it little and often. It's like well, it's like marketing. If you look at if you look at how do you, how do you market something, you don't market it by going here's an advert. Never seen that again. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. Um, also in marketing, you have to. You have to very much tailor your message to your audience. So, mm -hmm. and, and I, I, I think that the same, <clears throat> excuse me, the same applies to to cyber training. I think so. How how do you think organisations can actually do that? Can tailor that training to their specific audience within? So the I think it's like it's like with anything really. You need to think about what it is that the person needs to know. So a lot of the time in cyber, we like to show off because we we think we're doing cool shit, right? We're not. It's really boring for every for everyone else that's not in the industry. It's really boring. It's just you tapping on a computer. No one cares, right? It's not like you've played. It's not like you've been at a Taylor Swift concert. Like you've not been on stage with Taylor Swift, have you? So that's it. No one cares. A f so stop showcasing your knowledge. Stop showing off to people about everything that you know and just give them the information that they need. So what do they need to do the job? Brilliant, right? Taylor, I think if you just give them things that are, try and frame it in a way that will affect them. So if you say to, I don't know, Janice in finance, Janice, if you click on this phishing email, that means that you're not going to be able to send invoices out because the company's fucked, right? That's what she cares about. She cares about being able to send invoices out because that's probably what she's targeted on, right? So she, you, oh, yeah. you need to find what it, what is, what it is that motivates that person. So what is like, look at the KPIs. Look, what are their KPIs? How can you kind of relate that back to cybersecurity? If you do, if you do, if you click on this phishing email, that's going to impact your KPIs from X, Y, Z. If we look at it from that kind of perspective, then people are going to engage in it a bit more and stop bombarding them with that they don't need to know i don't need to know how a firewall works i genuinely don't care how a firewall works don't tell me about it no most people don't care how it works as long as it does work yeah exactly um 
Yeah, I think the, the the comparison to marketing is quite an apt one as well because we've seen a massive rise in marketing over the last decade or so about of gamification, making making things more engaging through um, mm. you know turning things into games, and and you have a lot of experience in that. Um, what what do you think the role that gamification is playing um, in cybersecurity awareness training right now? And do you think things making it more enjoyable? Should we be doing more of it? Yeah, so I think there's, well, there's two ways of motivating people, isn't there? So there's intrinsic factors and extrinsic extrinsic factors. So extrinsic stuff like, I don't know, if you do this and I'll give you a prize, like you might win a holiday or whatever. So, you know, externally motivating someone. But intrins- intrinsically, sa- um, gamification really help- it helps that kind of feel good fact. So you're like, yes, I'm at the top of the leaderboard. You get to, you know, when people say, what's the prize for this? And you're like, it's pride. You get your pride on the back of it. It's that kind of thing. So you feel accomplished. It encourages participation because if you and your mates are competitive, you want to beat each other, especially look at sales, right? How many sales teams have a leaderboard? Impl- Im- implement a leaderboard for stuff like reporting phishing emails, that kind of thing. But you can work. You can work in a couple of ways. So you can have um, like a one-off basis for specific competitions. So when I do the escape rooms, I t- so if I've got more than one escape room running at once, I'm like, right, guys, it's a competition. Who can get out? Who can get through the escape room the fastest and beat the clock? But you can also do that in ongoing learning. So if you've got an ongoing leaderboard about, you know, like I said, reporting phishing emails and that kind of thing, perfect. It'll encourage yeah. people to proactively look for it because they're thinking, I want to get to the top of that board. And then give them, I don't know, a prize if you've reported the most phishing emails in a quarter or whatever. Right. That does I know, it, I know that would... I do feel like potentially, I, I mean, if it was me, I'd just be reporting every email, probably phishing. I know <laughs> it's from HR, but well, it's phishing. Um... Yes. <laughs> well, I know, I know for a fact that it, that that kind of thing would work at Replied because there are some very competitive people, and I'm sure mm. that's, sure that's the sure that's the case with most companies. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm completely with you. Um, I think like let's talk let's talk now about about users. Mm. Uh, I don't like I don't like the the word users. No, anyway. I hate it as well. <laughs> yeah, it's not very good, but. But it is often it is often said that, uh, and I think Pied's guilty of it as well in our content sometimes that users are the weakest link, mm-hmm. um, and that your know, users should be the thing that you you know keep a strict eye on and you watch them all the time. And um, I think you've yeah. got you know a bit of an issue with that um, as a as a phrase. Um, so so what what why do, why do vendors like to push this narrative? Is it is it wrong? It it is categorically wrong. So if you are Let's, let's put it this way. If your entire business can be taken down by someone clicking on a phishing email, I think you've got wider security problems. <laughs> so what? how is the phishing email getting in in the first place? Let's have a look at that. Maybe your email filter's not set up right. If you've got a flat network, which has allowed one phishing email to ransomware the entire business, I think you've probably got an infrastructure problem. If you've got laps misconfigured, if you've got no privileged access control, so I can immediately get onto your network and then I can elevate my privileges to a d- domain admin. That's not the end user's fault, is it? That is cl- literally not that person's fault. Oh, They're not the weakest. So it's like when people say Windows is um, a weaker operating system than Linux. No, it's not. It's categorically not. It's just more widespread. So users are not the weakest link. They're just the biggest attack surface. Add on top of that the fact that we give them sh- training, and I mean horrific training. So if, you, if you're sat there thinking, ah, users are the weakest link, Cool. Okay. So what are you giving them to defend? How are you fixing that? If it was your firewall that was misconfigured, would you sit there and go, well, firewall's weak? Or would you sit and do something about it? <laughs> would you fix it? You'd fix it, wouldn't you? But that's not what we're doing. So we say we say to people, you're on the front line, going back to this military speak that we seem to like in cyber as well. You're on the front line. You're our first line of defense. Brilliant. Well, what armor have you given them? Someone from Primark. Fantastic. How about we upgrade yeah, no, to really. version? Let's go. Let's go, John not Lewis. Not really setting yeah, themselves up for success, are we? No, no. Um, not all. But it drives it drives me insane that people sit there and say users are the weakest link. No, they're not. Do you know what's the weakest link? Your security posture. Fix that first. Yeah. No, that's that's fair. I mean, uh, I think probably a lot of IT teams don't want to hear that, but but you know, that, that's no, probably, no, that's, that's the case. Yeah. No, they definitely don't. I've told them it loads of times. They definitely don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good good well um how, so from i mean from the perspective of your your wider employee base then i mean they're always getting blamed they're yes. getting blamed for everything um so what what do we do how do, how do we shift that narrative to, to be more a more of an empowering narrative how do we empower our users rather than just blame them for everything that goes wrong so i think like you said you hate the word users right 
so everyone in IT is like, we've got all these users. No, you haven't. Do you know what you've got? You've got colleagues. You've got colleagues that are the biggest asset, that are an asset for you to protect. The part of your infrastructure, the part of your environment, you need to protect them. So companies that end up blaming the end user, but then provide, like I said, provide them with fuck all training. How are you, so you're not helping them to understand it. You're just sitting there going, you're thick. Brilliant. Like that's not helping anyone, is it? So you need to invest more in the people because instead of them being the weakest link, they are the first line of defense, like we've said. So invest in them because they're the people that are protecting your business. We also need to stop telling them off when they talk to each other. This drives me mental. Talk to each other about a phishing assessment, right? If someone sends me a phishing email, so in a real life scenario, if I've got a real phishing email in my inbox and my mate next door's got it, a real one, not a, not one that the IT team sent, a real one, and I tell my mate about it, is the IT team going to be pissed off about that? Probably not. They're probably going to go, great, you've reported a phishing email. Thanks so much. But when the IT team send out a phishing email and people talk about it and no one clicks on it, that's suddenly, put, that, that's suddenly a fail because they've talked about it. So now we're not, we're not we're not breeding the right kind of behavior so it's got to it's be almost a, discouraging awareness yeah why would why would you not want people to talk about it i'd be buzzing if everyone started talking about it it's brilliant that's perfect yeah. exactly what we want you to do you need to reward exactly, the good yeah. behaviors if you're communicating fantastic so we sit we sit and say everyone shouldn't be working in silos blah 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 but then we encourage working in silos and it makes no <laughs> sense at all and then and then additionally to that, the IT, the IT team and the security teams need to go get a better image in the business because usually they're the ones that, are, well, we used to, in my old, I've had a few jobs, one of the jobs we used to call them business prevention team because I'm like, I want to do something and you're telling me I can't do it. And that's all you're saying. You're saying you can't do it at all. There's no work around for it. There's no, this is the reason why you can't do it. It's just, no, great. Well, that's yeah. really, really helped. That makes me really, really like you. Obviously not. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you're sat, yeah. if you're sat there just being grumpy every time someone t- some someone talks to you, if you're not actually helping users, you're actually prohibiting them from doing the job. Yeah, yeah, That's no, I, I completely agree. There, there's been a, a lot of there's been a big drive in the um in the security world recently to to improve people skills and improve mm. you know interdepartmental relations, and I think that's yeah that's something that still needs a lot of work. Um, but we've we've painted a, a, a you know a, a lovely a lovely negative picture of the world of uh, cybersecurity awareness there. Uh, so that's that's great stuff. So maybe we can switch up a little bit and and you can give me some examples of maybe some success stories that you've seen where where proper training has actually helped um, improve cybersecurity. Yeah, I mean, so I um, so I've got a couple of examples. One that I've done, and then one that um, one of my partners has done. So yeah, um, the stuff that I've done. So I sold unbelievably this isn't this is this everyone who knows me i've heard this story about thirty thousand times i sold an escape room to the sas um wow i know I bet they were very good at it yeah my friend my friend was like do you have to tell everyone this story i was like yes they're the coolest customer anyone's ever had so yes i have you were allowed to, to tell people that story <clears throat> yeah i've got a testimonial from them don't worry um <laughs> okay, so yeah, okay. they, they sent me a really nice testimonial that said actually from doing the escape rooms we actually we actually kicked off loads of conversations people discussing like when they've been hacked or when their company's been hacked and then what they could have done differently and kind of helping relate that into real world scenarios. So in the future, then you're a bit more prepared. Um, but I work with I work with a company called Hoxhunt, um, who they're Scandinavian, I think, um, but they've got a big UK presence now. And I've seen all their case studies about users being educated enough to understand that reporting the issues is actually critical. Because if an issue is reported, then the company's got the knowledge there to remediate. Um, which is why we should use phishing assessments. Instead of using phishing assessments to berate users and make them go to some mandatory training, phishing assessments should just be an assessment of your te- of your um, reporting mechanisms and how successful they are. Because if um, if people are reporting things to us, then we can deal with it. But if people are hiding it from us, then we can't. So yeah, if if the, like Hoxhunt have said that they've found loads and loads of in loads of instances that um, they're getting higher report rates on phishing assess and um, phishing emails because that's the kind of behavior that's being rewarded and that obviously helps to improve this posture of the company because people can then because then the it team know what they're dealing with but if it's just sat there in someone's inbox waiting to click on it then it's just a uh, ticking time yeah yeah no that that's well that's it's that's good to know that we've got demonstrable evidence that cybersecurity training can work if it's mm. done properly yeah um so that that is good. Um, one thing I've heard you I've heard you talk about before um, is hands-on learning, mm. um, and um, you know, 
how it helps support knowledge retention. Um, so could you perhaps just just take a moment to discuss the, the, what the benefits of hands-on learning are in, in this context? Yeah, so um, this is actual from actual science, not from me just making this up, by the way. <laughs> um, okay. So when you you engage more of your senses, so instead of like just watching a video where you're just listening to it and watching it, if you've actually got your hands on things, then it makes it a lot more um, memorable because you're creating more connections in your brain, which means that your memory recalls a lot easier. So it's impossible to ignore it because you've got to participate in it. It's um, it's better for memory recall. It's you, The forgetting curve actually slows down because you've created more memories. Um, and it's much better for neurodiverse people or people with really short attention spans, much like myself. I have got the attention span of a goldfish. Um, but if I've got to stand there and do an activity for an hour, rather than sitting and watching a video, I uh, I will engage in it a lot more. So yeah, hands on learning definitely the way forwards. I think. Yeah, well, I, I hugely agree. Um, are there any specific examples that you have of hands on exercises that you, you've seen to be effective? Yeah, I mean, so we we do tabletop exercises with C suite regularly, right? Mm. So why would we not push that further down the chain and let people get an understanding of cybersecurity without it just being us watching videos? Um, so, yeah, like I said, with the SAS, they thought it was a brilliant exercise. But they, they I mean, they, those guys are used to working hands on, right? They're not all sat behind a desk. Or hopefully they're not. <laughs> hopefully not. Anyway. Um, oh, some of them must be. But yeah, but it gets people talking. It gets people engaging. Um, yeah. So I think so we do like tables. So the escape rooms, obviously, is. I'm going to tell you they're brilliant for hand, as a hands-on exercise. But there's other tabletop exercises that you do. So I work with IP Performance, and they've got tabletop exercises where they've got um, like a breach simulator, but it's all um, interactive and you ch- chat into each other. And I think, yeah, if um, yeah, if you're doing if you're doing hands-on stuff, it's just infinitely, it's just infinitely more engaging and it's more memorable. You you talk about it. You wouldn't. Well, let's put it this way: Have you ever gone home from work? And said to your other half, "Hey, guess what I did today? I watched a security trading video. <laughs> Unless it was an Ian Murphy nah. one, it's never happened. <laughs> but yeah, you might go, nah. you might go home and be like, "Hey, guess what we did today? We did this hands-on thing where I don't know, we did a cyber escape room, or we did this tabletop exercise, and this is what happened in it because it's something a bit different. That's not just you sat at a computer. Certainly more memorable, isn't it? Mm. Um, yeah. The, well, are there are there some examples then of how?" Um, how companies can incorporate that kind of learning in those kind of practical experiences into their training programs at the moment? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm working with a few companies at the moment that are doing, like, awareness days, not just in October. Let's all remember, cybersecurity awareness isn't just for Halloween. It's for, you know, the entire year. We need to keep on top of it. Um, so I've got I've got a few companies that I'm talking to at the moment about running awareness days. Um, you could have, like, mini challenges through the year. I don't know, like, if, like we said about... Um, reporting phishing emails who can get to the top of the board with that kind of thing I don't know, quizzes prizes taking time away from the screen though to go and have conversations with people so doing like lunch and learn where you start explaining i don't know something about cyber security but not with a load of slides try and relate it to something practical i mean i was sat in the pub the other week with my six-year-old as you do um and my, okay. and my friend we went for sunday lunch it's not as bad as it sounds um right, okay um, but we were teaching her about networking using beer maps and she understood it a lot. Then if okay. I just sat, if I just sat and talked to her about networking, she'd just look at me like, what the f- <laughs> fuck she's six, right? But we sat and explained, we sat and put beer mats on the table in the mid lines. And then we were like, this is, if I talk down this one, then it's going to come out this way. And this is how traffic moves along the line and that kind of thing. Um, so just doing daft shit like that. Like people do Lego days, don't they? Where they've got, there's that, um, there's that game yeah. where you can do Lego. Like any, anything where you're not sat behind a bloody screen. I mean, that's the most the most easy thing I think people can do is just get away from the screen and do mm-hmm. something actual physical. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I'm fully fully on board with that. Um, and we've talked a bit about <laughs> um, escape rooms, mm-hmm. uh, and obviously you're a you're a massive um, fan of escape rooms and incorporating them into cybersecurity awareness as you should be. Um, I was say that. That would are be there weird. any? It would be weird if I wasn't. Yeah, it would be it would be <laughs> odd. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But so uh, I was gonna, I'm gonna ask you then: Are there any limitations to um, escape rooms when it comes to addressing cybersecurity awareness? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, there's, I mean, it can't cover, it can't cover all of the threats that are, that we've got out there. I mean, it probably could do, but I just haven't built them yet. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say, what, what, what can cover all this? 
all the threats. Well, yeah, that's that is true. I mean, they do so they lend themselves really, really well to talking about password security. Hopefully, for obvious reasons, because you get a password, then you move to the next bit, and then you need a password. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So it's really good for password security. We try and incorporate other bits in there. So the first um, escape room that we've got has got like a phishing email in there, and that's kind of you meant to understand that's how the attacker got in, and you can kind of have conversations off the back of that. But yeah, it's not. Um, it's never going to cover everything, and the fact that it is physically interactive means it's never going to cover all of your organization either. So. You know, with re- remote working, it can make it a little bit difficult. But then if you're making it into an event and you, you're doing it as a kind of, this is a bit of a treat for you rather than come and do some training, then um, then I think you can drum up a bit more interest. Um, oh, yeah, or for, for larger or global companies, then it could be a bit a bit more difficult. But, um, yeah, I've not taken over the world yet. I am going to South Africa a couple of times this year, though, so maybe world domination is yeah. on the um but That's yeah not too far away then yeah no yeah so um but yeah i think you don't you don't want to you don't want to just do escape rooms because then they would get repetitive so i think like anything you've got to have a, a mix of stuff going on um yeah to keep it kind um, of keep it fresh so yeah i think yeah probably just the fact that we can't cover every threat that is out there it makes it makes, makes sense then so how how do we so we've got to have we've got to have both them presumably we've got to have um we're going to have some interactive experiences and we're going to have some more traditional um, cybersecurity training stuff. So yeah. what's the balance then? How do, how do we get the balance right in that? So I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about how you engage people. So how what is it that they're interested in? But also look at their learning styles. So people have got different ways that they like to learn. I mean, I, I used to, God knows why, but I used to be really, really good at listening. I'm going to sit it now. Um, which doesn't bode well for me in sales, really, does it? But yeah, I'm pretty good at listening. You're doing well today. <laughs> listen i've got no attention span um so i can't sit i cannot sit and listen to someone talk at me for half an hour like this doesn't that just doesn't interest me doing something i'm brilliant with um but other people aren't like that some people prefer to just listen like they might want to listen to a podcast so do stuff like you know do a podcast and talk about cyber security but you need to ask people what it is that they want to do and get them involved in shaping their own training because i think you'll get much better engagement if you've asked them how do you want to learn this? I think it's just a simple question of going, of asking your users, what do you want to do? Like, what's the easiest way? Let, let's break down the barriers to it. What's the easiest way for me to transmit this information to you? And find out what they want to do. And then build your awareness program around that. Yeah, well, it's, it sounds like um, uh, escape rooms then specifically, they, they'd massively complement existing um, awareness programs. Would you agree with that then? Yeah, so I don't, yeah, they're never, I, I've said this from the beginning, they're never ever going to replace a security awareness program because, um, well, because it's just not possible. Um, nice. And you need, you need to bring, you need to have, like we said, different, different elements of learning styles. But I think, yeah, um, they're, they're not a stick. They are a carrot. Hopefully, anyway, everyone that has done them has enjoyed them. Um, so they're kind of, a, they're kind of doing it as a, re- like, well, not necessarily as a reward, but it's something that you want to get involved in. So trying to frame, sorry, um, trying to frame cybersecurity training as a positive rather than it being, you fucked up on a phishing assessment, so now you have to sit through Dull Dave and his 500 PowerPoint slide presentation. Um, so yeah, if you, they're great for kinesthetic learners. They're great as a kind of fun activity if you want to do a couple through the year or whatever. Um, yeah, so they can definitely complement it, but yeah, they're not. They're never going to replace it, and that's not the intention with it at all, anyway. No, completely fair. Um, so let's take a, a step back then and just talk a bit more um, generally about mm-hmm. security awareness programs and and kind of what they should look like. Um, could you? kind of outline for us a couple of a couple of the key or the maybe the most important components of what makes an effective overall security awareness program yes yeah, so i think we've probably covered covered it all already but as to recap what we've discussed um yeah. yeah so i think we need to look at continuous learning um because it can't just be a one-off and then you never learn anything ever again uh, it needs to be bite-sized information because people's attention sp- we live in a tiktok generation i mean i sit on an evening and scroll instagram reels i'm not i'm too old for tiktok yeah. but i do instagram um so i've got in- i do instagram reels because i can listen to something for 30 seconds for a minute but all over that i'm like nah and i think a lot of people i've got that kind of attention span now so bite-sized information is important interactive yeah. element super important doing stuff that's hands-on because it helps you remember it for longer um stop beating people up 
So stop using a stick, start using a carrot. So I think that'll help affect more um, positive cultural change within your organization and having and having a mix of um a mixture of things that that you've got available or the mixture of tools that we've got available for users to engage with because you know like i said one size does not fit all yeah yeah absolutely um and i think we we definitely touched on this um this before but each every every organization is obviously very different they have their own challenges their own um different cultures and that kind of stuff so it's not a one size fits all approach um so what what are what can organizations do practically speaking to make sure that their programs are gonna are gonna fit hopefully so i think we sit there and think my business is super special my business is so different to everyone else's business it's not you know what it's it's not you've all mm. got the same challenges you've all got issues with fishing right. we know you have everyone's got an issue with fishing we've all got an issue yeah. with password security everyone's got that so it doesn't matter what industry you're in and it doesn't matter what sector you're in, it doesn't matter how big your company is, those are the two challenges that you've got. Because okay, it's user related, because users, they're not the weakest link, they're the biggest attack surface. So that's the thing that we need to be, they're the things that we need to be focusing on. So I think, yeah, tailoring, tailoring it in terms of the threats that you've got. I mean, there might be the odd industry or the odd organization that's got slightly different challenges. So I don't know, like legal firms, I was talking to a CISO the other day, a legal firm, and he was saying we've got wire fraud as a, big issue for the organization um so yeah i mean there's some industry specific stuff or you know ot that's that's a whole other barrel of fish um but yeah i think most organizations have the exact same challenges so those two things uh but in terms of in terms of culture so you need to just look at what your culture is so if you're a email digital first business then you might react better to online learning if you've got a load of developers who like sitting there and doing stuff on the computer then maybe doing stuff on the computer does work better for them but um, but definitely look at getting a consensus from your people and understanding what your if you have to first of all understand what your organizational culture is before you can decide what kind of training fits it. Because I think a lot of com- this is a whole other thing that I could go on a rant about. But I think a lot of companies they say that they've got culture X when actually in reality it's not that at all. Um, it's a <laughs> totally different culture when you start working there. Oh. Then it's not the same. Um, so yeah, I think you need to have an actual, realistic understanding of what your organizational culture looks like, and then you can kind of tailor it to that. But make sure, like, I think the biggest thing is to make it inclusive, so so that everyone can kind of be a part of it. Um, yeah. So that's yeah, that's that. Hey, makes sense. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna chuck another another marketing term at you because uh, mm. you know from from a marketing side of things everybody loves talking about best practices yes. um and, and writing blogs about what the best practices are and everything so what would be some best practices for um for companies when it comes to improving their their current security awareness stuff okay so we've got things like phishing assessments which i hate phishing assessments i used to have to sell phishing assessments and i refused point blank to sell them to people <laughs> Um, because I thought you're gonna back, you're gonna. I used to say to people, "What are you using this phishing assessment for? What you, what's the actual outcome that you want from it?" And if they, if I had any inkling that they were gonna bat users over the head with it, I said, "I'm not telling you it. We can literally go buy it somewhere else. I don't care." Um, so yeah, I think, but but phishing assessments in this instance, in terms of monitoring your ongoing, um, like the like the ongoing effectiveness of your programs, it can be useful. So we can look at things like well, the reporting rates of phishing email so then you can see oh, the organizational culture is moving towards reporting it rather than hiding it um so can stuff like you know password audits so we can see have people actually been using password managers or have they actually got the same password for every single service um so stuff like that um obviously there's you know, tools out there so they can monitor the dark web for leaked credentials and that kind of thing um but i think the important thing is to do is to establish some kpis for your security team because then they're invested in helping your people. So, you know, like I said, fish, getting getting phishing emails reported, that should be a KPI for your security team mm. because that makes yeah. them invest in actually going out and educating those users and, and engaging with them in a way that makes them want to report it rather than being a grumpy chat and telling them off every time they've clicked on something. That's not the way to en- mm. engage, with, engage with people. So I think that, I think that kind of thing can really, really support it. Mm. Yeah, very good. Um... We're gonna let's let's take a, a quick move to everyone's favorite topic now and talk um a little bit about compliance. Yay. Um <laughs> I know, I know. It's very it's, it's almost as fun as cybersecurity awareness training, isn't it? <laughs> um, 
but uh yeah how how does it uh, be, be it boring it is also very important hmm. um how how is compliance at the moment driving um driving the the need for security awareness so i think compliance has always kind of been the main driver behind it because you know why do companies invest in anything unless they've got to be compliant <laughs> with some standard or another um so i think it's in, it's included in stuff like iso 27001 fisma um socks uh pci dss all those kind of, all those main stand all those big standards they all stipulate that staff should have some training in the handling of personal information which means cyber you know you have to understand cyber security at that point um i think the issue that we have is that companies see these requirements as something that they need to do to tick a box um and then they don't really take it seriously so they tick a box by doing it once a year and they go yep all of our people are definitely trained in uh in keeping in keeping personal information safe are they really like where's the proof of that yeah it does drive the need for it like I said, it's a stipulation but it's how seriously people take their compliance with these standards because lots of people just use compliance as a we've got this so we can sell to more customers now yeah i, I, I know i know what you mean um are there are there any are there any industries or any particular regulations where where cybersecurity awareness training is is particularly heavily pushed or or really crucial yeah, I mean, stuff like well, where you're handling particularly sensitive data, so presumably stuff like legal teams, healthcare, FSI. Um, I'd arguably say anything in OT as well probably needs a heavy, heavier um, uh, focus on security awareness training because, you know, if I always say if uh, IT gets hacked, cool, you might lose some data, whatever. If OT gets hacked, shit goes bang. Stuff yeah, <laughs> pulled up. So, yeah, you need to be a lot more aware in those kind of environments, uh, which ironically is probably where there's the least awareness. But anyway, that's a, that's another whole that's another yeah. whole podcast in that in itself. And, uh, presume, presumably, industries like the defence industry as well, like the SAS, is mm-hmm. particularly important as well. Exactly, right? and it's you know it's such, yeah. good job that I, it's such a good job that I was here to help them. Really, wasn't it? It, well, it really is. Yeah, <laughs> keeping the, keeping the nation's data safe. Oh uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> if, if anything so, happens to the yeah. SAS, by the way, I'm not. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> You're not liable. No, no don't worry. <laughs> Um, so, the, I mean, ch- compliance is is a massive challenge for IT teams, and for a number of reasons, not just for for security awareness. But and there's always a challenge, I think, between um, how you balance, um, like how you balance culture where you want to be. Are you compliance driven, or are you um, are you culture driven in terms of security awareness? So, what what's the challenge? I think of maintaining that that balance. I think. I don't think the two things should necessarily be mutually exclusive, to be honest. So <laughs> you should be you should be doing security awareness training anyway, which then helps you to be compliant. Um, but I mean, a lot of the compliance driven training is stuff that's NCSC certified. And unfortunately, no, I'm not sitting on any NCSC certified suppliers here. Which is why I have not mentioned any names at all um, <laughs> during this podcast. But there is a lot of NCSC certified training that uh, is dull as dishwater, which means that no one's actually engaging with it, which then takes away from you actually creating a security aware culture. Um, they have, NCSA has actually, though, brought out a new certification for CIR, which is Cyber Incident Res- uh, Cyber Incident Response, I think. No, it's not Incident Response. Uh, cyber Incident Exercises. Um, CIA, not CIM. Um, yeah, so that's kind of doing like it's basically certifying tabletop exercises so that's some right, so okay. that'll, that'll be quite cool so i'm actively working towards that um but you know as a, as with anything that is remotely related to a government body then it's it's insanely drawn up <laughs> process so <laughs> yeah. we're getting the, on the escape room certified because then um you will actually be able to tick a box by doing something cool um like an escape room wow. um but i think yeah, yeah. It's, it's super important that you just have a mix of approaches because you know there's always going to be the compliance driven stuff which might be you have to do ncsc certified courses which i've seen like, i have seen that as a as a stipulation before um but also you want to do something that's a bit of a treat for your users which is why everyone should just do in a cyber escape room um, that is that is the perfect way i think to finish <laughs> um yeah i think i think we've given well we've hopefully given um it teams a lot to think about there um and yeah hopefully we can 
Sorry, go I on. Sound, I sound like I've been super negative towards them. Like I think they're all. T- I don't think they're all. T- loads of my <laughs> friends are CISOs, and loads of my friends are working yes. security. But I think there's there's the, no. there's a there is there is a there is a large proportion of the industry. I, <laughs> kind of things I like. don't think we've. I don't think we've said anything that those people would disagree with, really. Mm. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I think you're safe there. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, th- thank you very, thank you very much for joining for, for joining me. Thanks for giving us your time. Um, it's been really interesting. Um, I mean, hopefully, we can make strides towards towards a better security awareness culture. Yes, fingers crossed. <laughs>